Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From a ridge overlooking the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, September 23rd, 2018. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are back, everybody. We are welcoming you once again to the humble bunker we have here on the ridge, and we're delighted you've chosen to spend a little bit of time with us studying the Word of God. You know what? The the book of Joel... (laughs) is only three chapters long. We've done only two-thirds of it, yeah. which is appropriate considering today's 23rd. But uh, uh, it, it's, it is it's rich in information and prophecy. And, of course, we dealt with the whole Joel's Army thing mm-hmm. two weeks ago, which seems like forever ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, in the meanwhile, we uh, had a wonderful time at a family reunion. And uh, then last weekend, of course, was the uh, the amazing True Legends Conference, Transhumanism and the Hybrid Age. With Albino and Bird. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't watch the live stream, you don't understand what that's all about. It's a long joke that ends with the punchline. Somebody locally uh, couldn't rent a car, and he said it's because all the cars have been rented by people going to some, I don't know, something well, Doug, down we, in Branson. It was Doug Hagman of no, the Hagman oh, Hagman. Yes, he was yeah. telling the story, but he didn't say it. No, he didn't say it. He was, it was the one. A, he, he was the one who's trying to find a rental car. Yes, he was. And he was indeed. The whole story began when. Oh, you're going to tell the, the story. It's best. Well, he got to the Springfield Airport, the Springfield Branson National Airport, and found uh, that the uh, rental car that had been reserved for him was not there. And he said, "Well, I've got a confirmation number, and here it is." And so they checked and said, "Well, good news, Mister Hagman." There is a car running, waiting for you. The bad news is it's in Springfield, Illinois. So, um, yeah, uh, they uh, went to the... Uh, we feel d- sick about it. <laughs> yeah, D- Doug and Joe went to um, all of the other rental car agencies in um, the Springfield airport and found that there were no cars to be had anywhere. Springfield, Missouri airport. Springfield, Missouri airport, yeah. Presumably, if they could have rented a car and driven to Springfield, Illinois, they would have just turned around and driven to Branson instead, which is a lot closer. Oh, yeah. But uh, that was not the case. They they did get with a uh, local law enforcement officer and said, okay, where would we go to rent a car? And they were directed to an agency in uh, downtown Springfield, which had one vehicle left. Praise God. Yeah. And uh, so Doug was asking, well, why are there no rental cars in uh, Springfield? And it turned out, according to the officer, that it was because of this big conference in Branson where all of these people were coming in from out of town. And uh, the guy said uh, it was uh, something uh, with albino and uh, some guy named for a bird. So (laughs) instead of... Timothy Alberino and Steve Quayle, it was albino and bird. So that became sort of the running joke for the weekend. I want a t-shirt that says, <laughs> I love albino and bird. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a wonderful conference and some great information. Sharon started it off uh, and uh, received a standing ovation that was that was much very deserved, humbling. much deserved. Thank it, you, it was a lot of fun because for uh, most of your presentation, I was sitting uh in the auditorium um, next to Doug and Joe Hagman. And Doug kept taking out his iPhone and opening his notes app and, uh, you know, tapping in notes for based on things that you had just said, things that he wanted to look up and investigate or research further when he got back to, uh, got back to Pennsylvania. So uh, that was neat. And uh, afterwards I am told that Dr. Hugo de Garris, one of the world's foremost experts in artificial intelligence was telling Steve Quayle that, in fact, Steve is the one who said this, that uh, I, I I didn't know much, a lot of these things that she was bringing out there. So uh, that's That, that surprised me yes. a lot because uh, Hugo is, he is in the know. He spent 12 years in Xiamen University in China running the artificial brain lab. Right, right. And uh, Richard Dolan uh, had very uh, complimentary things to say when he told you directly, in fact. That, I know. Uh, yeah, that was really, really... He seemed surprised. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, uh, he's been used to speaking at conferences in a different milieu yeah. for quite some time. He's known as a speaker and author on um, ufology, mm-hmm. but he is a good researcher and tries not to go beyond where the evidence leads, although he does have a, a belief that... Uh, you know, the truth is out there. Mm-hmm. So, so, but, but he does not come at it from a biblical worldview. Correct. He, he describes himself as spiritual, but he does not take that next step and actually believe in Christ as savior. So, right, right. So pray for We're him. We're praying for him. And for, uh, and for Dr. Degaris. Mm-hmm.
So a, a very valuable conference all the way around. Um, of course, Tom Horn greatly missed. Uh, for those of you who've asked, uh, n- not no. Uh, he, he had, Tom's uh, fine. Yeah, he's he's fine. He had uh, you know, when you've got grandkids and you see them a lot, and they bring stuff home from school or daycare, mm-hmm. you're going to pick up a bug now and then, and that's basically what happens. So, but but essentially, he's also trying to spend more time riding and spend more time on the ranch. There, right, right. the Ministry of Whispering Ponies Ranch is top priority to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Tom is not likely to speak often at conferences going forward. So if you ever so. see him listed as speaking at a conference, it is, it's going to be a very rare event. In fact, it may be a never again event. Yeah. Uh, we've got announcements to make about next year, but we can't tell you what they are. Right. Uh, <laughs> we we can we'll, say that. We'll, we'll uh, reveal that later. It, yes. When, when we are free to do so. Um, the East Coast Prophecy Conference, uh, Southwest Radio Ministries. Tom has withdrawn from that conference. He but, has. Uh, our colleague, For the same reason. He's trying right. to you know, concentrate on the ranch. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we appreciate your prayers for Tom um, because, uh, you know, we pray for Tom and Nita all the time. No. I mean, that they set the direction for the ministry with which we're affiliated with uh, wisdom and discernment. But, uh, you know, health-wise, he's fine. Yeah, we uh, talk to them every day, so. Right. Uh, and Josh Peck will be filling in for Tom, so they, they found themselves Not a good place. Josh yeah. Peck! Well, it'll... Uh, you know, it's it's like the Donald Trump presidency. It may not be great, but it'll be hilarious. So. <laughs> Actually, it will be great. We, it will we be great, yeah. joke about him a lot, but he is one of those young men that I am so excited that the Lord has lifted up for this time and this and his Amen. purposes. Amen. Amen. And uh, so, yeah, I, I say that because that's Josh's we description we of love the Trump him. presidency. Yeah, it'll, at least it'll be hilarious. Um, and because of Josh's artificial hip. And you never hear him complain about this, by the way. Uh, no. Rare bone disease in his hip and his ankle that uh, led to... Uh, a hip replacement and he's mm-hmm. not i think he's just 35 now so uh it's the kind of thing you normally see in people who are in their 60s or older but yeah. uh, josh has had to have it done already but it means he gets special treatment every time we go through an airport so i know it's so much fun watching at least him. it's hilarious. hilarious yeah so well so anyway back to joel we're in chapter yeah. three finally yeah and some good stuff here and this is uh one of the reasons that um pastor carl gallops calls Jerusalem, the original ground zero. It's why I argue that Armageddon will be fought for the Temple Mount, for for Jerusalem. Amen to that. And by the way, if you love Carl Gallops, and who doesn't, mm-hmm. uh, you get to travel with him, with us, and the Fall Brothers in Jerusalem and throughout Israel next May. All you have to do is sign up at the Lipkin Tours, and we will yep. put the link to that in the notes for this fellowship. Yep. And uh, it's also at the... Uh, uh, the the banner right at the top of gilberthouse.org. Can't miss that. Yeah. So right there, black right. and white. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Father, thank you for this day and uh, for bringing us together again through this, uh, through this, this medium, this, uh, uh, the, the, through this technology that you made available to us. Uh, Lord, we are grateful for the joy in our hearts and in our homes, because we know from your word that um, our futures are secure. There are some rough patches ahead, Lord, but you have foreseen these. They have not surprised you. And uh, you have promised us that uh, there is a, uh, well, as, as the Apostle Paul wrote, that the glory that awaits will make the troubles that we suffer now as nothing. Lord, we pray that you'll guide us, grant us wisdom and discernment as we read your word. Help us to understand it. Add nothing to your word and take nothing away from it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Joel chapter 3. God brings the hammer. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, those words indicate yep. we're in a future moment, right. at that time, in those days, mm-hmm. time of the end. Exactly. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, this is why I argue in the book Last Clash of the Titans uh, in, in referring to the War of Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon. Gog and Magog, we often focus on who those nations are. You know, who's who's Gomer, who's Meshach, Tubal, uh, Beth Togarma. Uh, the, 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 forget it. For, for, forget all of that. When, when Ezekiel was describing the coalition coming against Israel under the, the headship of Gog, mm-hmm. who is the Antichrist, he named those nations to the north, referring to cosmic or supernatural north. But then he also named um, Put, which is Libya, Cush, which is to the south, uh, Sudan or Ethiopia, and uh, Persia to the east. But to Ezekiel's readers, 
Uh, those were the nations pretty much as far away as any of his readers would have been familiar with. So what he was saying, and what Joel is saying here, is that the whole world, north, south, east, west, from all four corners of the earth, globe. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they would be coming against Jerusalem. And the battle will be fought for God's Mount of Assembly. Exactly. And this Valley of Jehoshaphat, that word means uh, Ye- Jehovah, Yahweh, has mm-hmm. judged. Right, right. Which is amazing, of course, but it is thought to be that rift valley, that, that deep chasm between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem. The Kidron and Valley. Exactly, yeah. exactly. There used to be a river called the Kidron that mm-hmm. flowed through there, so this is going to be, one might say, just a place of bloodshed. And it's possible that uh, as... as um Zechariah prophesies when the Messiah, Jesus, lands on the Mount of Olives, descends on the Mount of Olives. It mm-hmm. splits to the north and to the south. That could be when the Valley of Jehoshaphat is created. That's performed. very possible. That it's, it's an amazing place. And again, once again, if you travel yeah. with us next May, you'll be able to stand on the Mount of Olives yes. and see what we're talking about. Exactly. The Valley of Jehoshaphat doesn't exist right now, but it will someday. Well, there is a depression between the Mount yes. of Olives and the Eastern Gate, so you can see that. Well, yeah. But it's not this massive chasm. And if you look for the Valley of Jehoshaphat on a map, you will not find it. That's right. So, that is very true. It, yeah. But if you look at it as a descriptor rather than a, uh, a place name, the Valley, valley of where, Judgment. The Valley of Judgment, the valley where Yahweh judges. Exactly. Then it could be the, it could be the, uh, the Kidron. And um, interestingly... The book of First Enoch also describes the final judgment taking place in a deep valley. Ah. So this is a consistent theme in um, Jewish thought during the Second Temple period um, and even before. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people. I'm going to stop you there. This divided up my land. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's going on now. That's been going on for several decades. Yes. Beginning with the Carter administration, uh, the the rules uh, between the United States and and Israel have been sort of back and forth. Mm -hmm. They've changed a lot depending upon the administration. Mm -hmm. And we are currently, praise God, Trump is very pro-Israel. Right. But look for that to change if we put uh, another person in that office republican or democrat exactly that's why i said another person because right. it, it may depend there are many republicans out there republicans in name only that have an agenda that is beyond that of our current president exactly um yeah don't get caught up in the republican democrat paradigm no. remember that during the george w bush administration Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said the time is now for a two-state solution. Exactly. And the Vatican is in favor of a two-state uh, right. solution. Because they want, and they've been arguing for this since uh, the 1940s, mm-hmm. the Vatican wants control over the Holy City. They, they want, want the control Temple over Mount. The Temple Mount and the, and the Old City. Right. And they floated that back in the 40s, trying mm-hmm. to uh, make that part of uh, the deal. Well, that deal has been, uh, that, that drive has been ongoing since the 19th century, mm-hmm. when it was became obvious that the Ottoman Empire was crumbling. Yeah. Uh, France and, and England and a number of other countries were all vying to get control of the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, the bottom, bottom line is there. there's more at work here than just Republican versus Democrat and... Um, Israeli versus Palestinian. It's uh, uh, sp- spiritual, supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true? Okay, verse 2 again. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people in the way that the uh, centurions cast lots for the cloak of Jesus mm-hmm. and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. <sighs> yeah, that's disgusting, but I hate to say this, but that sort of activity goes on today. Mm-hmm. And if you take a look at, if, you, if you're seeing this is a reference to the world leaders who have divided up the land and cast lots for the people, at the very least, this behavior goes on behind closed doors. And interesting, uh, too, that uh, in the Old Testament period, 
uh, we think of casting lots as playing dice, but actually casting lots was a form of divination. Yes, it was exactly trying so to this determine is, the will of the gods. Exactly. Plural. So this is this is spiritual. Yeah. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, in all the regions of Philistia? Stop there. We're getting references back to Tyre and Sidon. Sidon, the capital city of Phoenicia. Uh-huh. Uh, these are references to spiritual entities, I think. Uh, yeah. Tyre, as I argue in Last Clash of the Titans, and also in The Great Inception, uh, that it's a reference to the iniquity of the Amorites, mm-hmm. because the Phoenicians were just descendants of the Amorites. As the, you know, the Canaanites were just sort of a, a, a geographic term. Uh, the Phoenicians, <laughs> actually, is a term to the color dye that they created from those uh, uh, those uh, snail shells, the purple dye. Mm-hmm. So Punic, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. That, that was a, actually a right. Greek term. That's not what the uh, the the people of Tyre called themselves. That's hey, what we the Greeks Phoenicians called no, them, right? Exactly. Yeah. But um, it's interesting, the rest of this, uh, go ahead and read it, because uh, this is a very interesting passage. Yeah. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you are paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. Well, stop there, because again, if you're looking at this idea of spiritual warfare, mm-hmm. is this, okay, is this your volley in return for something I've done to you? Guess what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are so toast. <laughs> it, this, as you say, this is spiritual warfare, and this is a message to the gods behind Tyre and Sidon and the the uh, Philistines. The Philistines were, well, let me, let me read the next the next verse or so here, and I will, uh, uh, you know, th- this will connect together. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. And what's the alternate render? Or palaces, that is how that verse could be rendered. Verse 6, you have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. And this is interesting. The Greeks, at the period of, um, at the time Joel wrote this, and I'm thinking, I've got to go back and double check, but I think he wrote this in, what, the 6th century B.C., maybe? I think that's probably yeah. right. It, well, it says anywhere from the 9th to the 6th century B.C. Mm, what we know of Greek history only really extends back to about the time when Joel was writing this. We don't know much about the Greeks prior to the writings of Homer and Hesiod, uh, and they wrote in the 7th and 6th century B.C. So it's interesting that uh, they were mentioned here, but They've been able to determine from the type of pottery found in the ancient Philistine sites, Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, and Ekron, mm-hmm. that um, they probably came from the Aegean. And the fact that they uh, uh, were okay with eating pork. Yeah. Which was not a... Uh, <laughs> not only did the Jews not do it, but the Egyptians didn't do it either. And most of, most of the other people, in uh, the Semitic people in that region, did right. not eat pork. When they sacrificed pork, it was often... And I've got to find this reference again because it's important. Uh, a sacrifice to the dead. Right. An offering for the dead. Right. Uh, even the Hittites to the north who weren't Semitic only used pork as special uh, sacrifices. So anyway, the Philistines, Greeks, or at least cousins of the Greeks, perhaps. Um, so you've got uh, the uh, later in, in the New Testament, Jesus connects the storm god of the Greeks, Zeus, with Satan. When in the book of Revelation, where he connects the uh, great altar of Zeus at Pergamum and calls it Satan's seat. Mm-hmm. But also, if you go back to this previous um, indictment of you have divided my land, mm-hmm. if this is a continuation of that, you have sold the people right. of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks. Greeks sometimes represents just the West. The West in general. And um, Tyre and Sidon would um, perhaps be a reference to, if you wanted to look at this prophetically, um, and apply it to modern day, Tyre and Sidon would be a, the region under the control of Hezbollah. Yeah. And Iran to the east, because Hezbollah is essentially an Iranian proxy. So, hmm. If you are paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily, for you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples or palaces. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. And actually, that did happen in the second century AD when the emperor Hadrian essentially depopulated Judea Mm -hmm. after Mm -hmm. the Bar Kokhba revolt. Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them and I will return your payment on your own head. 
And you could argue that the IDF is doing that this very day. Mm -hmm. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the... Now, how are we going to say this again? It's not Sabaeans, S-A-B-E-A-N-S. It's Shavayin. Shavayin, the land of Shiva, where the queen of Shiva Mm -hmm. came up to uh, Jerusalem in the time of uh, Solomon. Uh, We're talking about... uh, Which is actually pronounced Shiva. Yeah. And I have yeah, no idea right. if yeah. etymologically it, uh. it is related to the Hindu god Shiva. That's a curious thing to look up. Yeah, just because they're homonyms doesn't mean it's the same thing. Right? Yeah, just sound alike, not not in any way the same. We'd have to research that mm-hmm. more. But uh, again, this is the the point Joel is making is that um, your people are going to be sent as far away as possible. Uh, they will sell them to the Shavians. Shavians. Shavian. Shavian. Okay, Shavians. Uh, to a nation far away, for Yahweh has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war, or consecrate a war. Stir up the mighty men. The Giborim? Well, possibly. Or it could mean stir up the, you know, the, the really good fighters. Well, yeah, we're not talking... I don't know that it's talking about uh, spiritual hybrids here or something. Right. Hmm. Unless he's talking about, uh, you know, stir it, up the Giborim... To draw them into Jerusalem, or to, or, because as God said, uh, I will uh, uh, gather all the nations and bring them down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So he, maybe this he is, did say that. Proclaim this among the nations. Yeah. So maybe this is the hook in the jaw. Yes, that, in, that's entirely possible. Yeah. Consecrate for war. Stir up the Giborim. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say. I am a warrior. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Yahweh. This is a taunt. It is. It is. It's, you know, bring them all together in one place and smash them all at one time. Uh Uh-huh. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Yahweh. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. You see the same imagery in the book of Revelation. You do. There's an angel that has a big sickle. But it's interesting that the sickle is used here, because the sickle is the symbol of the old god Kronos. Kronos, that I talked about. Yep. Yes. And that's why, by the way, the angel of death often represented in pop culture is is carrying a sickle. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, Father Time. Father there Time. Is a sickle. It's right. Kronos. Kronos. Yeah. Kronos was a grain god, uh, like Dagon, which is why Dagon is not a fish god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the Greek myth, Kronos used a sickle to castrate his father, which mm-hmm. I argue in the book is um, a representation of the old gods, the, these re- rebel gods, the fallen angels, trying to convince the world we have castrated. Yahweh. We have mm-hmm. castrated the Creator. Exactly. Yeah. You have so got that right. So here, th- this is this is God reversing the imagery as He does so often. The prophets do so often. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of Yahweh is near in the Valley of Decision. In case you wondered if this has to do with the end times prophecies, yes, it's right here. Yes, verse 15. Day of the Lord. The sun and the moon are darkened, and this would be reference to these pagan gods. Mm-hmm. I'll be writing about that in the next book. Oh, yeah. Mm. And also, it's something that Jesus told us in the very end. In Matthew yes. 24, he said the sun and the moon will be darkened. I mean, we see this over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. But it's more than just, I'm going to cut back on the light. It's, I'm cutting down these gods, small g gods. Mm -hmm. So in Hebrew, this would be Shemesh and Yarich, which are very similar to the Amorite names for these gods, Shemesh and Yarich, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, Jericho. Oh, yes. The city of the moon god. The sun and the moon are darkened to the stars, often representing angels. Mm Mm-hmm. In the Old Testament, then the stars withdraw their shining. Take oh, their shining is diminished. That's mm-hmm. a big deal. It's not just they don't glitter in the skies anymore. These are glowing, shining entities. Mm-hmm. They this is about their judgment. Yeah. yeah. Yahweh roars from Zion, 
and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But Yahweh is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. It's all about the Mount of mm-hmm. Assembly. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. Which is important, because as you'll see, when if you're coming with us to Israel... Judah, which is the southern portion of the nation of Israel, is pretty dry. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. mostly desert. And this is also a reference to the previous chapters that talked about the water flowing out of the temple and how it got higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Ezekiel. Yeah, that's right. Ezekiel temple. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, And the fountain shall come forth from the house of Yahweh, and again, that's Ezekiel, and water the valley of Shittim, which is uh, the valley of uh, acacia trees. And it's very dry there. Yes. Acacia is a bush that grows in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Egypt shall become a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness for the, for the, let me start that again. Egypt shall become a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence done to the people of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever in Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged. Or I will acquit their blood guilt that I have not acquitted. Yeah, verse 21. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for Yahweh dwells in Zion. And I think this may be a reference to, in the book of Revelation, you see all of the the souls who had been martyred mm-hmm. underneath the altar, and they're all crying out, how long, how Lord, long? till you avenge us. Mm-hmm. So now again, we're, yeah, yeah I'm now, sorry. well now now we skip to Daniel as we continue our Skipping chronological the, exactly this is in the order in which they were written yeah so presumably then uh, they, they, because Joel is not much known about the prophet Joel so it's the assumption there I guess is that uh, sometime in the seventh century BC because Daniel we can pretty well put right at the end of the seventh century mm-hmm. beginning of the sixth century bc some sometime either side of 600 bc well and this gives us the actual date beginning in 1 1 in the third year of the reign of jehoiakim king of judah nebuchadnezzar king of babylon came to jerusalem and besieged it well this is raises a question with historians because the third year of jehoiakim's reign was about 606 bc but nebuchadnezzar didn't besiege judah until Nebuchadnezzar didn't come to the throne until 597 BC. So, well, this is something that to Daniel at the time he wrote this, this is past. Right, right, and he may have been using a, a, a different uh, means of reckoning the first year of the king's service. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that there's a a, a contradiction here. It just no. means we're not familiar with the sources that Daniel used mm-hmm. to date the beginning, uh, or to to date the book. So, so bottom line, CBS can't be sure. Yeah, can't be sure. But again, sometime around 600 BC, give or take five years either direction. In verse two, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar's, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, or Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. This was a common practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, The treasury of his God, that would be the God Marduk, who is the city God of Mm -hmm. Babylon. And uh, because of Babylon's importance politically in Mesopotamia, it was considered the king of the pantheon, had replaced Enlil, who was Mm -hmm. the uh, previous. Again, this is that pattern where you've got an older God who was replaced by a younger God. You see that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, And interesting, too, the Chaldeans, that was the ethnicity that ruled Babylon at this time. Babylon as a city... We, we tend to think of Babylonian as an ethnicity and the Babylonians no, were the, no, the original Babylonians were Amorites, but then they were overthrown around the year 1455, if I think BC by the, uh, the Kashites, which was a tribe that came out of the mountains of Iran mm-hmm. and the Kashites ruled until 
7th century BC or thereabouts. Uh, the Assyrians had conquered Babylon at some point in there, and then the Chaldeans moved in, took over, and then overthrew the Assyrians during the reign of King Josiah. So, again, Babylonian, not an ethnicity, just a geographic term. We're David, dealing with not a yeah, fish cat. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, the Chaldeans, by the way, probably descendants of the Amorites. Scholars are pretty sure about that. Very true. And as I was saying, this is a common practice. Nebuchadnezzar was doing what many of the kings who had conquered a region did. You get the nobility, the the really bright people, mm-hmm. the royals, the princes, and you bring them in. You train them in your own courts. Right. That way, you um, you essentially cut off the head of the, right. the nation and you're ruling. You make them loyal. And mm-hmm. This happened later when the Greeks came in, and uh, the, then the Jews in Judea became Hellenized and mm-hmm. wanted to be like the Greeks. So, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so bring them in and teach them the language, literature, and language of the Chaldeans. That's the end of verse four. Now verse five. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. In other words, good stuff, mm-hmm. and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the king and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not... you want to go outside? No, you just, I don't. No. I just want to come in and bug you. They want to know, they, they, you've not mentioned me, and they all want to know, what about Sam? <laughs> <laughs> Sam's been coming in and just staring at this and then walking around. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Now, you have to ask yourself, is it defiling with the wine? Because wine's okay. Mm-hmm. So is is this not only about not eating pork or something like that, but also about not drinking anything that may have been sacrificed to an idol. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, it could have been uh, that it wasn't prepared properly. Um, right, it could have not, been, not what yeah. we call kosher. Exactly. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. This is a big deal because they were to be trained in the way the... Uh, um, well, the court of Nebuchadnezzar behaved. Mm-hmm. So you do everything. And the king would have taken this as an insult. I've given you my best food. What do you mean you only want to drink, you know, water and bread? Yeah, you're going to make me look bad to the king. Yeah. yeah. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord and the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Hmm. So the steward took away the food, their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded, this is three years, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king." In other words, they were hired. Hmm. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, a couple of notes on what was going on here. The uh, three-year period, this was according to uh, the sacred texts of the Zoroastrians. That was the Mm -hmm. uh, period of training that was customary 
under the Persian system to become a master of spiritual learning. Mm-hmm. So they were being trained in the wisdom of the Zoroastrians. Exactly. A pagan nation. And isn't that interesting? Yeah. And God was using them even then. He didn't, you know, say, uh, t- tell them to, you know, die rather than submit. They, mm-hmm. they submitted and they worked within the system. Sometimes, like spies in the camp. Right. Sometimes that's what you're called to do. And this is apparently what Daniel was called to do. In fact, even the name changes reflect the, uh, the, the change in culture and the change of the religious system under which they were living. Uh, Daniel, uh, his, his new name, Belteshazzar, probably means Bel, which is Marduk. Mm-hmm. It's the, uh, the Chaldean way of saying Lord, like Baal mm-hmm. or Baal. Uh, Bel, protect the prince. Abednego, probably a corruption of Abed-Nabu, meaning servant of Nabu. Nabu was the god of oh, wisdom, yes. the god of the scribes. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, not sure what Meshach and, and, Abed, or, and, uh, and Shadrach mean, um, but again, the point was to essentially indoctrinate these young men of Judah into the Persian way, the Zoroastrian way of, of thinking and worshiping. But even though their names were changed and they were working inside and being trained in the court of this Chaldean um, king, this pagan king, they didn't give up the faith. Right. They remained faithful uh, even when it became difficult. You know, they were tempted with this this rich food, which uh, was obviously not healthy. And of course, we'll read more about uh, uh, what sort of tests they had to endure. But uh, there are times when you, when God says, okay, you got to work within the system. We saw that with uh, Esther. We've not read her story yet, but uh, you know, we, we'll uh, see that as we uh, continue through the Old Testament here. Uh, Daniel chapter 2. And and by the way, this uh, idea of the the names with Abed-Nabu and uh, Bel-Teshazar, Daniel, Azariah, which, uh, what does that mean? I know that's that's got a Yahweh element. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, well, anyway, the, the point is that names in the Old Testament were references to the gods. Mm-hmm. Um, they had theophoric elements. Exactly. No, anyway, um, Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which is also a reference to the god Nabu, the god of uh, wisdom, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. I resisted singing the uh, the barbershop song. Yeah. <laughs> imagine, yeah. though, yeah. this is essentially he's called together his counselor, mm-hmm. his counsel. And imagine if in the White House today, or if in number 10, the counselors were called in and they were all magicians. Well, One might say they are today, but, yeah. but they're not openly so. And, you know, Nancy Reagan had... Uh, I know. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is how it was done back then. That was considered standard practice. Yeah. And it's probably to, still done that way today, but it's not so much. Yeah. Practice. It's in the, kind of on the QT, although it's yeah. becoming more and more open. Yeah, sadly. sadly. Um, and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. And interestingly, uh, in the original text of the book of Daniel, by the way, from this point on, you know, the, from uh, so the beginning of the book up until uh, chapter two, verse four, it was in Hebrew. But from this point on, where the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and then from here through the end of chapter seven, it's Aramaic. It's Aramaic, yeah. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, "The word from me is firm." If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation, to which... The king's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, to which the Chaldeans said, Hamana, 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 hamana. <laughs> Much hand-wringing and woe is yes. me. Verse 7. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, (laughs) because you, because you, politics hasn't changed Mm -hmm. in 2,600 years, has it? it? Because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, 
There is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, Donald Trump of the oh, yeah. 6th century oh, yeah. BC. <laughs> awesome. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. In other words, we communicate with them all the time, but they're not going to tell us that. Yeah. You have to tell us what your dream is, and then they'll tell us what it means. Yeah, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, um, look, if you're really talking to the gods, yeah, exactly. they'll tell you what's going on here. Exactly. And there, again, and there are, hamana, 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 hamana. <laughs> Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Ouch. Yeah, so the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. That's faith. That is. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom, be to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. It's, and by the way, it's let the, uh, blessed be the name of Elah. Ah, okay. All right. That's the Aramaic there, and it means the God of Israel or God. Yeah. But yeah. And this is the kind of thing where skeptics will look at this and say, well, okay, clearly this is the Daniel who was mentioned in the Ugaritic texts of 1200 BC, who was actually referred to as Daniel, the man of the Rephaim, Daniel, the man of Hermon. No, no same name, mm -hmm. different guy. But uh, because th they use L to represent God, which was a generic term for God. Um, yeah, the skeptics will try to you know, re rewrite the Bible to, mm -hmm. to mean something that it doesn't. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers... This is pretty clear that he's not talking about El of the Canaanites. He's talking about Yahweh, the God mm -hmm. of his fathers. By the way, Daniel probably wasn't terribly old. No, uh-uh. Because they man. were gathering up the young men. That's yeah. right. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Yes, he, he, clearly very young here, because if he was still around in the first year of King Cyrus, who didn't destroy Babylon, so he didn't take Babylon to like 539 BC, which is like, you know, 60 years later. Yeah, And this is just, you know, a few years after they were brought right. in. So yeah, this was somewhere around 595 BC, somewhere in that range. Ish. So yeah, Daniel was in Babylon for like another 60 years after this. Yeah. He may have only been in his late teens, late teens or early, early 20s. 20s. Yeah, exactly. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Now note, he didn't say, Save me and my friends, kill all the rest of these pagan dudes. Exactly, I was thinking the very same thing. Yeah. And Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And by the way, I, I, let me just interject this. There have been a lot of tablets that have been found from what is now Iraq and Syria from this period of time going back to the time of Abraham, where 
letters were sent to the various Amorite kings who ruled the city states in, you know, in, in that region. You know, the, the seer for the god, you know, Adu, Hadad, the, the storm god, is, mm-hmm. says thus, and, mm-hmm. you know, don't do this because, or if you don't do this, then you'll be in trouble. You know, that kind of thing. So this was not uncommon. Archaeologists and historians know this. So this is consistent with the way politics was done exactly. back in the day. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, As you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. And isn't this interesting? God using a pagan king who had destroyed and looted, destroyed Jerusalem and looted the temple and said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to show this to you. Mm-hmm. I know. Isn't ne- that a shock? That is interesting. I never really considered that. Until... Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. We'll we'll talk about this when we get through this section here. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth." Great Mountain, by the way, is a term that was used to describe Marduk and Mm -hmm. Enlil when they were considered the kings of the pantheon of Mesopotamia. And I'm sure that when the king heard this, he thought, oh, I know what this means. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. So, this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these." And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. Or Aramaic, by the seed of men. Yeah. Oh, They will mix with one another by the seed of men. Mm -hmm. But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And of course, that's one of these um, supportive verses that um, many use to say that in the last days there will be hybridization programs going on. Mm -hmm. At the Mm -hmm. very least, another incursion from the spirit realm. Yeah, yeah. Do I know for certain that that's what that means? No. There, there's very little in the Bible that I can say. I know for certain yeah, <laughs> that this yeah. is what this prophetic passage means, but I'd say that's a very likely candidate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, its interpretation sure. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. And for That's a big thing for him to say. And probably didn't make the priesthood of Marduk very happy. Mm -mm. Um, We get later into Daniel chapter 5, I'll talk about uh, some of the political conflict that um, arose because of Nebuchadnezzar's successor, Nebuchadnezzar. Anyway, the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. That's a big, big deal. Similar to uh, the way Joseph Joseph, was honored in the uh, court of Pharaoh. And and there are those who will look at this, you know, and and try to analyze this as um, a myth and say, well, clearly this is just a, you know, a a retelling of the Joseph story. Like, no, No, it's not. Um, Now, what what does it mean, these, the the statue? Uh, Daniel made it very clear that the head of gold was the kingdom of Babylon, uh, the kingdom of the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar. And at the time, at the peak of the power of Nebuchadnezzar, he controlled the entire ancient Near East. Everything that we see on the map today as Western Iran, Iraq, um, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Southern Turkey, um, everything, all of that was under the control of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom based at Babylon. Exactly. He was essentially the world ruler. Right. You can put it that way. King of kings. And then after that, you you have the silver, which is probably the Medo-Persians coming in. Right. Cyrus and the Medo-Persians. And then the bronze, that is the Greeks. Probably the Greeks. And then, of course, the Romans follow that. And they are well known as the Iron Kingdom. Right. And then the iron mixed with miry clay, if we're looking forward, because we're, we're told that this kingdom won't be destroyed until... The great mountain, or the stone cut by no human hand, crushes it. And we're told that it comes in and it hits the feet. So clearly, we are currently living in the age of miry clay mixed with iron. Mm-hmm. So the remnants of the old Roman Empire are still around. Right. But it's it's really not what it used to be. So that's one interpretation of iron mixed with clay. Mm-hmm. But another one, of course, is that as we approach that time when that wonderful stone comes in and smashes them all, mm-hmm. that uh, um, we are living in a time where there is a spiritual uh, cohabitation with yeah. the world rulers, mm-hmm. at the very least. And it may be that they're co-opting them and telling them what to do. Uh, but it also may mean that behind closed doors, there are rituals taking place much like in the days of Og of Bashan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, or all the way back to Nimrod, mm-hmm. who became a Gibor. Uh-huh. Was becoming was a first, god, yeah. Right. So, uh, and, and, and Gilgamesh, who, if my belief is correct, my theory is correct, uh, not my theory, there are others who proposed it, I agree with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gilgamesh on the uh, Sumerian king list is two generations after Enmerkar, who I believe, uh, the Sumerian king Enmerkar, who I believe was Nimrod, um, and Gilgamesh is described as two-thirds God, one-third human. How, how did that happen? Uh, well, Gilgamesh's mother was supposed to be a, a goddess, but mm-hmm. uh, like Nimrod, it could be that through some ritual that uh, he was changed somehow. Um, you know, it, 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 is it possible that that sort of thing actually takes place, can actually happen? Don't know for sure. Well, it's it? also possible, too, that it's taking a look at this idea of transhumanism. and That's the and, next thing, yes. You know, merging... The clay, the, the human being with an iron entity, if you want to represent the the robotic aspect. I mean, mm-hmm. just look at the film Iron Man. Yeah. He's called Iron Man, for right. goodness sake. Yeah. And it's an idea that's, well, one of the reasons, getting back to the conference we talked about at the beginning of the study today, the reason for the conference and the reason that Tom Horn and Steve Quayle, um, you, and, you and me have been mm-hmm. sounding this warning for years now is because the idea is being promoted to our kids as a, kids as a good thing. And the kids will think sure. it's great. Avengers Infinity War, as they were warring against Thanos, the mad Titan, mm-hmm. by the way. Yes, Titans are coming back. The, uh, the the strategy for defeating him was to raise up a group of enhanced humans, 
um, an artificial intelligence controlling a really cool cyborg suit, that's Vision, Mm -hmm. and uh, sorcerers, Dr. Strange and his colleagues. Mm -hmm. In other words, all the stuff that God said in the Bible, don't do this. That's what we're supposed to do to defeat the old gods. It's like we need white magic to defeat the black magic. Right. And in God's eyes, it's all black. Exactly. Is that how iron will mix with miry clay in these last days? Could well be. Um, I did an interview last night with um, Tom Dunn and Jared Crestman. They've got a new film out called This Is a War. And uh, I'm... I love those two guys. Doing some really, really important work. The previous film, Detestable, tackles a really unpleasant subject, which is... Um, satanic ritual abuse, and one of the one of the featured uh, speakers or, or guests interviewees. interviewees on that program, uh, that film was uh, Dr. Greg Reed, who we met down at the uh, Sons of God Giants of Old conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, their next film uh, is, which is just out now, is called "This Is a War," and I was one of the interviewees in this back in um, March at the Hear the Watchman conference in Dallas. I sat down with Jared and Tom and recorded a session. Had no idea how they would use it. Tom said he didn't either, but uh, the other interviews they put together make the point that we are in the middle of an age when occultism is becoming ever more mainstream to the point where it's coming into the church. Uh, Joanna Michelson, whose name I had heard, but I wasn't really familiar with her. She wrote a book called, um, oh, no, I'm forgetting the name of the book, but uh, Jared had read it years ago. It's uh, J-O-H-A-N-N-A. Um, she had a, a, there we go. The beautiful side of evil. Mm, Oh yes. Um, about 35 years ago. And, uh, I remember that. I read that a long time ago. Okay. Well, she doesn't do much in the way of speaking or interviews these days, but, uh, they were able to get an interview with her and several others who shall we say have come closer to the spirit realm face to face, Mm -hmm. uh, especially the occult aspects of it. And, um, Joanna Michelson made a really good point. She was talking about how the occult has actually entered into the church, that we don't recognize it for what it is anymore. And I guess that was some, a point that I made as well during our conversation. We have become so numb in the Christian church in America that we don't recognize evil when we see it, when it's staring us right in the face. It's not only numb, we're simply undereducated. We don't know our Bible. Well, yeah, that was it. I said numb and our theology has been so dumbed down. And, numb uh, and dumb. Yeah, yeah. Numb and dumber. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, Ms. Michelson said, uh, she put it this way when she was talking about a cult in the church, uh, you know, things like yoga being practiced in our churches, which is Hindu mysticism. Yep. She said, you know, we, if there are people who will complain that if we, we throw this out of our churches, that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. She's talking about uh, contemplative prayer and um, meditation, stuff like that, which, again, Eastern mystic practices that Mm -hmm. open you to spirit possession, influence, demons. Mm -hmm. And she said, look, that baby, (laughs) it's got red reptilian eyes. It's Rosemary's baby. Exactly. What the heck is it doing in your tub? (laughs) Amen. Well said. Anyway, uh, that is the, uh, the miry clay and the iron trying to mix together. We are building a kingdom here on earth that uh, is going to be destroyed when the rock comes down and uh, it is built on silicon yeah built on yes, sand yes and uh, the uh, messiah will come and destroy it when he sets up his kingdom that will never be destroyed amen so, to that how are we doing on time we're right at one hour well it's time we go then uh we want to remind you that we would love for you to join us in israel really really would love to you and i know that those spots we've only got so many spots on the buses and they're mm-hmm. filling up fast thanks to carl gallup's church yeah and many others down at the branson conference that took our flyers and said we're in fact some of them came back later that day and said we've already paid yeah so we know that the spots are going we'd love to have you join us also if you are anywhere close to gettysburg in yes. october we're going to be there Thursday, October 18th through Saturday the 20th, we'll be at uh, the Wyndham Gettysburg for the East Coast Prophecy Conference, and uh, Josh Peck will be there as well. Stephen Strang. Come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, like I said, we He's got a Josh. couple of fascinating topics. He's going to be talking he about the occult and does. the UFO phenomenon. He really does. Yeah. And uh, Stephen Strang, author of God and Donald Trump, Dr. Larry Spargimino, Dr. Bob Glaze, uh, a number of other speakers that... Uh, I'm not familiar with, but, uh, you know, Larry and Bob are both really discerning. And if they recommend them, 
then uh, I, I look forward to hearing what these other speakers have to say. And um, it should be a beautiful time to go to Gettysburg, too, because uh, it should be pretty near the peak or maybe just after the peak of the uh, the trees. So oh, yeah, yeah. Trust me, that area, it will be incredible. Uh, so if you can join us there, that would be awesome because, honestly, that's our last that we know of conference for the year. For we get to re- re- we get to rest and write. Yeah, yeah, write especially lots and lots of writing. Um, so if you want to uh, register for that, uh, log into swrc dot com Southwest Radio Church mm-hmm. swrc dot com, and uh, hopefully we will we will see you there. We'd love it. Yeah. Um, any other bits of business? Oh, uh, by the way, we're on iHeartRadio now. So if you have the iHeartRadio app on your mobile device, you can uh, use that to get us. But we also have a uh, free mobile app for the Gilbert House Fellowship. Mm-hmm. You can download that. There is a link to the app stores for the uh, iTunes app and also Android app. It works on any smartphone or tablet on either of those platforms. And uh, again, totally free. Gets you all the archives going all the way back to Genesis 1-1. Yeah, and also if you have any friends on Facebook or social media or just your neighbor, and that person doesn't know where to go to church. I know that in this day and age, it's really hard to find an actual brick and mortar church that you feel like you're getting where you feel like you're getting fed. Um, that doesn't mean you need to neglect the opportunity to do a formal study. Mm-hmm. Derek and I are just folks. We we don't have special degrees or anything like this in eschatology or biblical studies. But we have some tools that are available to you online as well. We encourage you to share uh, our study with others and, uh, you know, get get your family involved. If you want to move beyond our study and do something at home on your own, hey, look, that is fabulous. You Mm -hmm. can use these same tools. Get your children to read the stuff out loud, practice their reading skills, and ask them, what do you think it means? Mm -hmm. Teach your children discernment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a little little bit of history uh, goes a long way mm-hmm. because ultimately what it comes down to is what, what did it mean to the prophets and the people who they were writing to? Right. So what did it mean in the 6th century BC when Daniel was writing? What did exactly. it mean? Yeah. So, well, here's an example. I mean, if, if the Lord tarries and 500 years from now, the social media uh, sites are unearthed somehow, they manage to queue them up and figure out, oh, look. LOL. What do you think that meant? Well, we're not really sure, but it, we think it might have had to something to do with this face that they're worshiping. <laughs> it was some sort of blessing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so context is very important. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, your word, which guides and instructs us. And um, knowing that um, your word is sure. We, we don't understand prophecy fully, but someday it will be revealed to us. And we look forward to that day because on that day, Lord, we know that that will be the day when we see your face. We thank you for this time that we share together. We pray for your blessing in all those who are truly seeking your word and your will and deeper understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, if you heard that sound, it was my ice pack sliding off my chair. Yeah, I, I have a pulled tendon in my back, so I've been sitting on ice. <laughs> we're, we're both getting so old. And uh, that's okay. As long as I can get through the day, that's, that's all right. I care about. Glorified bodies, here we come. Amen. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. Thank you.